What does it take to become an audiovisual translator? Coming up. Hello and welcome back to the Freelance Verse. From a very rainy Brussels today, I hope the lighting is okay, it's quite dark in here. Uh, but I can't complain, we had a lot of sun, so and I like the rain anyways. I'm back today with another episode of specialized uh, series that I like to do on my channel. I invite three uh, experts from a field on to discuss their specializations, how they got into it. And I give you guys a few tips if you're thinking about specializing in this area. And uh, today we talk about audiovisual translation. But just before we get into that, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by MemoQ. Thanks so much to MemoQ for sponsoring this channel and this video in particular. MemoQ is a tool that helps translators improve their productivity, increase translation quality and meet tight deadlines. You guys know that I love this tool, I use it every day and I made many videos about it, so I'm happy they are back on the channel. I put the link in the description, if you click it you'll end up on their landing page, you can fill out the form and the first 50 people to do that receive a 30% discount on a Memo MemoQ Translators Pro license. Now let's introduce today's guests. So we are back with a new episode of Specialized on my channel. We have again three experts of the field. Uh, today we talk about audiovisual translation. We have Chloe, Marcena and Dot. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on the channel. Uh, I think it would be amazing if you could introduce yourself. Uh, what is it that you're doing? For how long? And it would be great to yeah let the people know who you are. Dot, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I'm Dot. I'm a freelance translator and subtitler, and I've been freelancing since January 2019. So it's been about three and a half years. Um, I translate German and Dutch into English and yeah, create English subtitles and uh, closed captions um, as well. Um, and I also um, host my own podcast. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to mention it later. Of course, I will put it <laughs> all in the description. Uh, it's an amazing podcast. People should definitely check it out. Okay, great. Uh, Chloe, would you like to continue? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, my name's Chloe, and I'm um, also a freelance translator and subtitler. Um, I work from French and Italian into English. And very similarly to Dot, I also do a lot of um, English into English work. So that might be creating English subtitling templates. English material or um, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, I also do kind of standard translation as well, although I do do mostly um, audiovisual, and that's mostly in the fields of um, entertainment, marketing, and education. And Marjana. Uh, so I specialize in subtitling as my colleagues here, and I've been doing that uh, since more or less 13 years now. And uh, my main language for is English into Polish, but sometimes I also uh, translate from Spanish and French into Polish. Uh, and apart from being a subtitler, I'm also a committee member of Subtle Subtitles Switch. Okay, amazing. So this video, as you know, you guys are experts in the field, but the title of the video might be a bit confusing for some people, audiovisual translation can be a big word, so I would like to start this discussion with kind of a definition. Maybe Chloe, can you tell us what in your uh, professional opinion uh, is, what does it mean audiovisual translation? Yeah, sure. So I think I would describe audiovisual translation as kind of an umbrella term, which has um, different kind of aspects within it. So one of those is subtitling, which obviously the three of us all mentioned that's something that we do. And for me, that's the main um, area of audiovisual translation that I personally work in. Um, although I do do um, script translation as well, and I have been I have done that before. Um, subtitling is the main area, but I know that there's other so, um, audiovisual translation work um, in the areas of dubbing as well, which is something that I've personally got a little less experience with. I mean, correct me if you disagree, but I would say that a lot of people, when they refer to audiovisual translation, they're mainly talking about subtitling. Okay, great. Uh, what would you say, Dot, uh, what does it take to, to uh, break into this industry, to specialize as an audiovisual translator? What is your background? How did you end up here? Um, I mean, I think there are a variety of ways you can go into it, as with like any kind of translation, really. Um, but personally, I, um, as part of my master's in translation, I did a module in audiovisual translation. 
Um, and that's kind of where I learned to use the software and everything and where I kind of learned about subtitling and found that I really enjoyed it. So I then did my uh, dissertation as a practical subtitling dissertation. And then after that, I did um, I like did some volunteer work um, doing closed captions for a charity in Cornwall. And then from that kind of um, managed to find an agency where I then did more work and got more familiar with like typical subtitle guidelines and the different software and kind of then found more clients after that. So for me, it was sort of like a gradual <laughs> learning. Yeah, exactly. Learning as as it way. always is, I think. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's go to Magena. Let's talk a bit more about actual work that you are uh, working with. What, what are the text types that you're commonly working as a subtitler, as an audiovisual translator? Well, personally, I work mostly uh, in entertainment. That means feature films and TV series. Uh, these are my favorite type of, types of work because, well, I'm also a, a big cinema fan and I'm a movie buff, so this is what I enjoy uh, personally the most. But I don't shy away from other types of work. You know, in audiovisual translation, you really have, you, nowadays, you have a real boom for the audiovisual content. There's no shortage of work, I'd say. Um, what's more uh, and more challenging is to find uh, a good agency or a good client that uh, you know would respect uh, you and pay you well, and also understand the importance of uh, having your content uh, translated or subtitled in our case uh, um, in high quality. I guess the like the corporate videos. I also see that in my daily work are kind of the the gap fillers, right? Because there's always something there to be done it. And then when you can actually score a, a nice series or a movie, that's that's the dream, right? I would say if you say that, you're living the dream that many people have of, of actually working with feature length uh, media. That's amazing. And, but that must be quite tough, right? How, how do you get the contacts in this industry? Because that's not just normal agency clients that you find um that offer you uh, feature length movies right that you have to work with directly with publishers i assume not necessarily you know there are various ways to work on that type of content you have a large service uh, language service providers that have this type of work you have uh, boutique agencies smaller ones that also can commission that, that type of work and you can also work with independent filmmakers or with film festivals that I would call more direct clients. How would you say, Chloe, how do you do that? How can you establish yourself as a as a freelancer just working from home? It's always tough for people, right? I mean, you, you're starting out and you're maybe not really sure about your, your abilities, your skills yet. And then everyone online tells you, you need to establish yourself. You need to get out there and do stuff. But can be tough in the beginning, right? How was it for you when you started up? Yeah, it was quite, it can be definitely tough in the minute. Um, yeah, to start out um, and kind of get yourself established. And I I started freelancing right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. So that was also mm. a little tough. Um, but I actually studied a master's in audiovisual translation specifically. So I was quite lucky that that helped me um, stand out, I guess, when I was applying um, to agencies and also marketing to clients. But I think it's also really important as well to have an online presence and um, kind of establish yourself and in that way so that other people view you in the way that you want to be viewed and in the work that you offer. So I think that's a really good way of establishing yourself. And the other thing would be kind of like the networking and speaking to other people um, that are in the industry and finding out um, what they do and how they kind of get their clients and things like that. I think that's really important. But it's, it's definitely like with any kind of freelancing, it's tough in the beginning, um, but and you've got to build it up. Um, I found that I had to apply to kind of I would say literally hundreds of agencies in the start to try and find um, clients and then you you slowly start working with a couple and you build it up from there. And In terms of online presence, all of you three are doing an amazing job. I mean, when I was planning this video, you were the first people I thought of and you all agreed. So it's amazing that you're here, <laughs> truly the experts. What I was wondering a bit, like I, I also offer uh, subtitling services. I do that quite a lot as well. Uh, but I never, like a few years ago, I wasn't really aware that 
audiovisual translation could be a specialization, right? I always thought this would be a service for me. So I never thought to specialize in this. Uh, what would you say, Doc? Do you need also a specialization uh, more content specific? You know what I mean? Like in terms of documentaries, movies, uh, you know, sports content and stuff, or you really market yourself as, an, as a subtitler, audiovisual translator in any field? To be honest, it's only natural that you would have something that you'd end up specializing in really, I think, anyway, like, and I do think um, it does kind of make sense to specialize more in something like, for example, I do mostly like movies and TV shows and that's like what I'm familiar with and what I've gotten familiar with. And if someone asked me to do like, I don't know, a, a video that was like legal content, I would be like, no, like just like I would turn it down if it was text, like I'm not familiar with the language. Okay. So I think like you do kind of need to like have areas that you know, just with text translation really, like you can't you can't really translate or create subtitles or something when you don't understand what they're, <laughs> what they're talking about. One thing that's always interesting to me is uh, issues, problems that are caused in, in certain specializations. Marjana, can you tell us a bit what are common traps that you would find on your everyday working life? I think it's common for all types of uh, translators uh, working freelance is uh, um, the main challenge is to find good clients and to when you find them to maintain, maintain them and to work with them uh, on a regular basis. And if they are happy, you're happy and then it's a win-win situation. Um, and it's really hard to find uh, that client, that type of clients. And I say maybe this is the, the biggest challenge of that work and uh, to find a client that w w would respect you, like I said earlier, and uh, you know just understand and see the value of a high quality subtitling because there are also clients that you know uh, just would commission into anybody. And we were talking earlier about the specialization. I say, I say that, um, that maybe a, a subtitling can be regarded as a specialization in itself because this is a different type of uh, translation than a text translation, obviously. But no, not everybody understands that maybe uh, entirely. I mean, uh, you work with different uh, constraints and restrictions and limits. And this is something that you need to learn. And there are, of course, university courses or postgraduate studies and so on. There are also uh, companies that offer uh, courses online, some are better, some are worse. Uh, but uh, maybe this is a little in unpopular what I'm going to say, but I think for the end clients, uh, your skills are most important than your degree in many cases. And as a subtitle, you need to have a many set of skills. And these are these are not only um, linguistic skills, uh, which are of course, you know, basic skills that you need to have uh, and you need to be a master of your target language, for example, um, you know, grammar and spelling and punctuation that all needs to be impeccable. But you also need to be a good writer in your own target language because uh, working with entertainment, for example, uh, you work with different slangs, different registers, and your subtitles need to sound natural all the time. I, yeah, I can spe especially really re relate today to what you said about like you need to understand the target audience because it's now 5 p.m. for people wondering and the whole day today I spent subtitling like a, a Real Housewives of New York episode uh, into German and you know it's incredibly hard to to put yourself into the shoes of like 50 year old millionaire white women in New York that then you need to somehow transfer this to Germany but you don't really want to do too much because people still watch it for the New York aspect right so there's so much in there and of course all with extreme small uh, uh, character constraints so yeah it's definitely a lot of skill there to transfer this properly so thank you very much for this these insights. Uh, Chloe, I think it was you that mentioned uh, that you are also doing, how did you call it? You accessibly translate for people with disabilities, right? Yeah, so um, as part of my master's, I actually studied um, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing. So that's something that I also offer. Um, so that, that might be um, including translation. So I translate and make it um, make the subtitle suitable for the deaf and hard of hearing. So generally speaking, that's putting in 
kind of the name labels of the characters when you can't see who's speaking and also labeling sounds. But generally speaking, that's what um, that would entail, um, which is a very specific skill in itself, being able to um, yeah, say yeah. what a sound sound like sounds like with words. It's, it can be exactly, challenging yeah. at times. That's when you would put it in brackets, for example, when like yeah, a, a fast exactly, car yeah. goes through or something. Okay. Yeah, I try that to watch. Um, yeah, when I try and watch like Netflix, I try and put the them on so I can get some ideas of what what the labels that are used because sometimes you have to use your imagination quite a lot to make sure it's accurate. Yeah, um, are there like the common industry is, industry yeah. practices or do you just make the sounds up mostly by yourself? So it depends. Sometimes I have worked with clients in the past who have had to kind of like a set list to kind of pick from, but that's not that common. Um, so usually you kind of, yeah, you just obviously you don't make it up out of thin air, but you, <laughs> you you don't have any restraints in that respect. You you have to decide the best way yourself to label label certain sounds and certain music to, com to try and convey the message that the sound conveys to um, hearing viewers, but not um, in like a biased way. So that would be for, for uh, hearing impaired viewers, and then you would also have blind or vision impaired viewers. Then you would have to also well, how would that, that, then you you would have to have a an, another audio track to explain the surroundings, I assume, right? Does anyone yeah, I have think experience I, with that? That's not something I've personally got experience with. Um, mm -hmm. But I know, yeah, the audio description is something um, that exists and I guess could be considered as another area as well of audiovisual translation. Um, but personally, it's not something I've got experience with at the minute, but it's definitely another interesting area. Dr. Marcena, have you done this before? No, I haven't, but like uh, Chloe said, it's a different kind of specialization within subtitling. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, not subtitling, audiovisual translation, actually, because it's just, it's kind of uh, uh, audio narration of what's going on uh, in the video for the blind and visually impaired people. And it's uh, I think it's rising to the, um, to the surface more recently uh, as a, a part of the whole accessibility movement that is being heard more and more lately, and I think it's great. And I also, I, I would anticipate that more and more people would uh, specialize in that uh, going forward. Uh, let's move on to the tools that uh, you guys are using. Dot, can you tell us a bit, uh, what is it that you're subtitling in? Are you using CAD tools as well, or is it more uh, specific subtitling tools? Um, so, yeah, I use like specific subtitling software. Um, it kind of varies depending on which client I'm working with, because um, most of my like big agency clients will have their own online software that they just kind of give me a login to and then I use their software because it's also like a um, what's it called you know when they like assign the jobs on there as well yeah, yeah. you're actually exactly. just using it to do the work um, so and I actually generally prefer using those um, but then like for direct clients I would usually use AG Sub which is a really good free tool. I mean, you probably have used it as well. <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, but I think, I think personally, if I had more like work with direct clients, I would probably invest in like an Una, Una subscription or something. Um, but at the minute, like I do more work with agencies with their online software. So it's not really worth it for me yet to do that. But I think it does offer a bit more than AG Sub does, but AG Sub is amazing for, a free software, um, I think. All right. Uh, one last point, more or less last point, is uh, that I want to talk about is pricing. Um, I know that pricing can be super tricky when you first get into this industry because uh, it's so complicated how people want to pay you. Some people want to pay you by the minute, by the but by the hour, but then video hour, working hour, you get confused. Uh, uh, maybe Chloe, can you tell us a bit about pricing what people should look out for to not get ripped off that I see so many newbies are? Yeah, it's a really tricky one with pricing. And I find that it's even, it's already quite tricky with translation, kind of document translation, but I find it even trickier with subtitling because I feel like there's even less data out there about mm -hmm. um, rates and I think that you know that's saying something given <laughs> how little there is about translation rates as well. Yeah, yeah I would say that for most of my projects and um, my clients I um, am paid or I charge per minute and I find that that works quite well. Um, the best kind of advice I would say for kind of setting rates, it's tricky because when you start out you're slower 
anyway. But I think it's quite a good idea to kind of have an idea of an hourly rate and time yourself to subtitle like a minute or 30 seconds and then kind of extrapolate that out. So you can see if you're getting how, what you would be paid per hour, if that makes sense. That mm. when I've been asked in the past how to set subtitling rates, that's usually the advice I give. Um, although, like I said, it's it can be tricky because you, you tend to get faster the more experience you have. So it also depends on, there's so many varied variation between subtitling jobs themselves as well. So for example, I could be given a video to subtitle and it might be just that I have the video and I have to listen to the audio and make the subtitles. Or they might give me a script um, that's just the dialogue or I might get a template which is already pre-timed with the spotting and everything and then I just have to translate. So that yeah. each of those already entail completely different rates to each other. Um, so it's unfortunately it's difficult to say, kind of give a definitive answer of, of how you can tell that you're the rate that you're offer that you're being offered is is suitable. Yeah, yeah, but already all these tips are super useful because that's what people yeah. need to look out for, right? You need to really yeah. check what you get from the client. Do you get the template? Yeah. I mean, if you have a template versus just a video, that's that it's cuts the time difference. in half probably. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, and definitely just be aware that if someone tells you, can you quickly translate or subtype the seven minute video? Mm. It's not going to take you just a few minutes, right? That's, no. That's, that's a lot of work and yeah. especially with longer jobs when it's like one hour one hour two, one and a half hours already when you're done you still have to re-watch it again right so mm. just to give an idea i kind of allow myself 30 minutes a day 20 to 30 minutes depending on material i would never kind of take on much more than that unless it was really desperate or yes. really you know, dialogue light um okay. that's kind of i wouldn't but that's me personally. There's other people that would be able to say more than that. And there'd be other people that that would be too much, but. I do about the same, but I think it also can vary a lot depending on the genre. Like I've done like, like subtitling like a stand up comedy where they're just, someone is on stage constantly talking and you're also translating like comedy, which often is quite difficult compared to like a nice slow rom-com where half of it is just like people dancing around and music, like. <laughs> It makes such a difference. Or oh, horror well. movie. Oh, yeah. Or, or, or horror movie. Horror or action. Yes. Uh, these are the, just the best. The subtitles love them the most. Yeah. I did once a super artsy, like uh, all scenic shots of 20 minutes, and there were maybe 10 subtitles in there. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was interesting. <laughs> it was beautiful, though. <laughs> Okay, we are coming to an end. Time is running out. So I would like to finish this video with a word of advice from all of you for people watching this video, young students maybe uh, uh, thinking of, about getting into this industry. What would be your uh, tip for them, Dot? Would you like to start? Um, my number one tip would be to network. I know Chloe did touch on it earlier, but like definitely, definitely network um, and um, have an online presence and get to know as many other translators and subtitles as you can because you can learn so much from each other and also we often refer each other for work so it's got lots of benefits. <laughs> Absolutely. Marjana? Well actually I would have a lot of advices but uh, if I would uh, <laughs> limit myself to one uh, uh, I'd say join your local AVP association. Uh, I mean uh, being a freelancer can be pretty lonely and uh, joining an association with uh, uh, fellow translators uh, from your country um, can help you to you know, find advice and find guidance from more experienced people. And they can guide you on such things like, for example, uh, what are your rights as an author in your country or whether you are eligible to receive royalties or what are the fair working conditions and what are not. And this, this all can help you to avoid some of the mistakes that uh, freelancing uh, uh, beginners uh, often make. Uh, and also networking, like uh, girls already said, uh, uh, you can uh, find a place in an online catalog of an association and, you know, people just know each other and prefer uh, each other for other jobs. And, and if your country doesn't have a um, association for audiovisual translators you are uh, welcome to join support we put all the links down below of course so people can also reach out to you for all the other tips you have <laughs> and chloe to finish off the video 
Yeah, so I definitely echo um, what Dot and Marjana said about kind of the online presence and the networking. There's a little bit of overlap there. That's definitely something that I have found very useful of being a freelancer. But to kind of go to like the other side, the work side, I would kind of just say um, um, keep practicing your skills with subtitling. I think that's really important. Um, there's lots of um, opportunities with um, volunteer work and there's um, opportunities, um, Dot mentioned EduSub, um, which is a free software. So I will always recommend people to download the free software. There's a few others, Subtitle Edit is one of them and play around with them um, take a video that you might already have and just have a go. And um, if you like it, keep on with it. And if you don't like it, maybe it's not for you and that's fine. Um, but yeah, just enjoy it and keep at it and keep practicing. And Brilliant, thanks so much. This was very insightful. I'm very happy to have met you all today and I hope it was interesting for you guys at home. Please let me know in the comments which specialization you would, you would like to see next in the series. And uh, yeah, make sure to subscribe to the channel and I see you next Monday with the next video. Bye bye.